Oftentimes we go looking for the weight we've lost instead of focusing on the ideal self that we want to be. So I found it interesting. Like when we are focused on losing weight, do we then go looking back for the weight we lost <laughs> for it to pile back on? Is that part of the yo-yo phenomenon? I've always been curious about that. One of the things that I've recognized recently in, in such a powerful way is focusing on my vision of how I'm going to be in my 60s. Okay, only four years away on that one. My 70s, my 80s, my 100s. So what does that look like for me? How do I want to be living my life out? What vision do I have for myself? And how does it feel to be living that life and maintaining that? So when I start focusing on the things I don't like about myself or the things I didn't do or should have done, could have done, would have done, just eliminate that term terminology to focus, to refocus on the good, the positive, the vision that I have for myself in the, in the future, working with, you know, wow, gosh, tens of thousands, hundreds, of, hundreds of thousands of women in my online community and tens of thousands of women one-on-one, -on -one, I recognize that we get stuck. We get a plateau that we can find ourselves regaining the weight we work so hard to lose. And sometimes we go digging for the answers of why that is versus identifying the right next step that we need to take. And sometimes it's mindset. We can be doing everything right, or we do need to change things up. Like I write about in my book, Menu Pause. That's why there's five different six-day plans that each change something. Maybe it is supplementation. Are you drinking your Mighty Maca Plus every day or your morning elixir? Are you drinking too much coffee or alcohol? Um, are you getting enough sleep? Is your mind in a positive, healthy state? Are you focusing on all the blessings that you have in your life? All the, the brilliance that you are as a human being and the relationships that you care so deeply about. So in today's Girlfriend Doctor show, I want to bring on a guest that really has specialized in working on sustainability of your lifestyle, of your health, of your um, physical achievements that you've had, or even to attain those physical achievements, whether it's losing weight, whether it's uh, muscle mass, what it may be, that has kept you from feeling the best you can feel at the state you're at the place you're in right now. So to help you attain it and to maintain it. So we want to talk about attaining and maintaining your ideal physique, state of health, wealth. And of course, we're going to put relationships in there. So thank you for being here on the Girlfriend Doctor Show. I want to introduce you to Martin Silva. So um, he has a beautiful accent. He is in the UK uh, right now from New Zealand. He's just a, a lovely, a lovely human being. And he has been focusing on um, coaching and personal training for over 13 years as an online transformation coach for the past two. He's been a natural bodybuilder and has competed at a high level and now helps women just like you and men to attain and support their lifestyle in the best ways possible. So join me in welcoming Martin Silva. Well, welcome to the Girlfriend Doctor Show, Martin. It's great to have you here. It's amazing to be on. It's an honor. Well, I wanted to ask you before, when I read your name, Silva, are you Portuguese background? It's a good Portuguese yeah. name. Yes, that's right. My great granddad is actually from Madeira, the Portuguese island. So I don't speak Portuguese, but my great granddad is from there. Yeah. Yeah. My uh, father is Portu was Portuguese and from the islands of the Azores. So Quebeca, Cabeza had the, you know, a little... Uh, squiggly line under the sea, but when he was in the U.S. Navy, they cut that out. So, oh, wow. um, Cabeza is Portuguese. There's actually a little town in Portugal called Cabeza, Cabe Cabeza, and it's very famous for its Christmas celebration. So you'll have to check that out sometime. I have to check it out. Funny you say that. My great granddad was actually in the U.S. Navy as well for a little while, 
Um, but that's another conversation. He actually went AWOL from there and then he ended up in the UK. I could tell you a story about my great granddad, but I won't go into Jose's uh, life story. <laughs> we'll be here forever. Oh my gosh, <laughs> he sounds amazing. He sounds He's a amazing. character. Huh. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, well, I love that. I love that for sure. So awesome. Martin, um, how did you get into what you're doing now? So I, a little bit about your backstory. Sure, sure. Yeah. So I started off basically personal training when I was like 19. So I've been in the fitness industry now for like 16 years almost. And I just fell in love with lifting weights from like the age of 16, basically, because I've always played sports and, you know, I played rugby from a young age. I'm from Wales in the UK and rugby is like our number one sport. It's, you know, our pride and joy. So played that from a young age, then got into lifting weights to try and get bigger uh, for rugby and just fell in love with it, really. Just got, you know, fell in love with it, found my passion. And then, as I say, I qualified as a personal trainer at the age of 19 and never really looked back. And over... You know, just to cut a long story short, I got into bodybuilding and stuff as well. Did that for a good few years on and off. Ended up competing like nine times as a, a natural competitor. Um, and yeah, went through that journey as well. And uh, that's that's kind of another conversation. We can, we can touch more on that in terms of uh, the struggles that I had, you know, because there's a dark side to that world with, you know, being eating and body dysmorphia, all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm thankful for those experiences as well because that has now enabled me to actually help more people. And, you know, I've got my qualifications with nutrition and stuff like that. But I think the more important thing, and you, you'll, uh, you'll kind of identify with this as well, Anna, is your experience, right? What you experience, the behaviors you have to change, the journey you go on, your own personal transformation journey. Uh, it's enabled me to actually have more compassion for for my clients and actually just be a better coach as well. So now I'm, I, I do my coaching online. So I'm a transformation coach and I help people basically you know, unlock their true potential. So that's beautiful. So give us like one of the things is that we talk about, we get stuck, right? We want to attain the goals, but mm -hmm. we want to ma maintain them. That's right. So that sustainability of the, of the things that are working for us. And that's one of the big pieces in what you do. Can you talk like, that's the truck, like give us an example of uh, helping someone you know, attain and maintain? What are some of those gold nuggets? A hundred percent. Yeah. So the first thing is, is obviously not changing more than one maximum, two things at a time, because, you know, with health and fitness, people try and go, most people try and go to, from zero to a hundred. And some people that I take on, to be honest, most people I take on are already at a decent level, but they really want to, like I said, unlock their true potential and get to that next level with their physique, with their habits, you know, with everything else, really, and uh, and just really optimized. Um, so uh, an example I used actually before, right, when we spoke last was uh, a client I had with, with diabetes, for example, right? This is a good example because he was already at a good level. He'd been lifting weights for a long time. But when he came to me, he was just kind of, he'd hit a plateau. And basically, obviously, he was carrying quite a bit of body fat around his midsection, and, you know, two, two and a half years later, I'm still coaching him, but we literally reversed his diabetes within, it was like three months or three, three to four months. We reversed the diabetes. He wasn't even in the range of uh, being insulin resistant anymore, either. Incredible. And how we done that, just to give you an example was again, just making like one or two small changes at a time and just being consistent with those things. And what I say to people is everything that I design for my clients is designed to like complement their lifestyle and not complicate things because let's be honest, everyone's busy, right? If you want to add more things to your to-do list and get overwhelmed, that can be a problem then. And that's when people kind of go on the, uh, the on or off wagon, uh, sorry, on or off wagon mentality. Uh, you know, the all or nothing mentality is kind of very common, you know, because most of my clients are type A personality. But what we did is we just th did the fundamental things. We looked at his nutrition first and foremost and simply consistently increased his protein. Um, but we did it in a way where we didn't really add too much at once. So it was simply like, well, how can we hit this protein target and get it through whole foods? It's like, okay, maybe you could do with a bit more kind of grass-fed beef in your diet. Let's uh, get more of a variety of good quality protein sources where you can get some of those good fats as well, like wild Alaskan salmon and stuff like that. And then just by simply adding those things, instead of restricting things and actually trying to take things away from people, my method is to add things. And then what happens then naturally when we look at nutrition is they start slowly replacing uh, certain foods, increasing, you know, improving their food quality, adding more whole foods to the diet, 
eating more protein. And you know yourself, when you eat more protein, it blunts your appetite. So they tend to crave those things that they used to struggle with, those processed foods, less and less. And then naturally their body starts to respond. So that was kind of the approach of Rob and then just simply getting him to, to, to move more. So we, we added like 2,000 steps to his to his daily amount. That's all we did. Within that three months of him for first his diabetes, we, all we did was add 2,000 steps to his daily target, what he was doing already. Uh, we made those subtle changes to his nutrition. And naturally, then he, he went into a calorie deficit just because of the quality of the foods he was eating and more protein. And then we switched up his training, really. So we tra- like added the smart piece to his training so we could get maximum results and, you know, basically train the full body. So, you know, when it comes to strength training, 80 to 90 percent of people, they're going to get better results by training the full body because uh, it's not just the science hitting the body parts more frequently is one thing, but it's what can the average person stick to forever, right? People don't look at fitness like this. They go, right, okay, I'm following this 90-day plan. I'm going to go all out. But what happens when you stop? And that's what happens to most people is they lose consistency, which I always say to my clients, you know, the most in, the, mo- the worst program in the world done consistently is going to get better results than a world-class coaching program, program like mine done inconsistently. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <clears throat> so let's talk about that. Say you're working with the 50 year old woman who's in the perimenopause menopause transition, mm-hmm. and she has 30 pounds to lose or more. And um, hasn't maybe has been doing walking, but otherwise not exercising. How would you stepwise her? Yeah. So obviously, it's always going to depend on the individual, but it always comes down to the fundamentals, right? So the first thing I always look at is sleep, right? So this is the first thing I always look at. It's like, right, let's have a look at your sleeping pattern. You know, your, the regularity of your sleep, you know, are you kind of, is it sporadic? You know, can we, can we avoid blue light? Cause you know, most people are literally on their phone or laptops right up until they go to bed. So I'm looking at that first and raising some awareness and maybe making one change or improvement to sleep. And then the first thing I'm going to do then normally is I'm going to get people to, to basically keep a food diary and track their food. And a lot of the times you'd be surprised, right, Anna, is the results I've actually had. So if I had a basically a peri- uh, menopause put woman or a woman already in menopause, if they came to me and they've never tracked or counted calories before, don't get me wrong, uh, you know, when people hear counting calories, they're like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. It's not a destination. It's just a good tool to use as a starting point. Um, and when they do that, I've had great results in the past, even with actually one woman who was perimenopausal, uh, just by getting her to track her calories and look at her sleep quality, really, and then gradually just increase her movement. And um, because obviously, when you're aware and you actually shine a light on certain calories and certain foods, you actually naturally start eating less, right? And this has been proven in research. So it's it's simple things like that. But then uh, the big one, then again, it's going to be the same for most people anyway. Um, but when it comes to just increasing your protein target, right? So just basically having more protein consistently. Uh, not only to blunt your appetite, but naturally when you're having protein from good quality animal sources, for example, you start replacing the other foods then, right? You start replacing the sugars and the processed foods naturally. And then obviously as a result of that, people tend to eat less uh, and lose weight. But just to answer your question. How much protein are you typically looking at? How do you figure out what's enough protein for someone that they're not going to go into gluconeogenesis, but they're going to stay in that fat burning state? Yeah. So I'll look at basically for the average person in pounds, I'll look at about 0.8 grams per pound of body weight. Right. So if it's a woman, you know, let's say a woman's wearing 120 pounds, let's just say roughly 100 grams of protein. Right. So that's generally what I'll aim for to start with. Um, And with the gluconeogenesis thing, I understand that. But a lot of the times when it comes to people having like uh, the, the research is kind of varied. But even having like higher protein than that, from what I've seen, it doesn't seem to be uh, an issue for most people. So generally, even like up to a gram per pound of body weight, really. So but obviously combining that with a proper strength training program as of well. Ideal body weight, Martin, or? Oh, uh, generally, uh, sorry, generally that's lean body mass. Um, but sometimes I'll just do it on total body weight just to make things a bit more straightforward, really. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the big rocks. And when it comes to the gluconeogenesis and those kind of things, I look at those things a bit kind of later down the line, you know what I mean? In terms of getting someone moving forward first and actually seeing them, feeling results. And then we'll, yeah, but I never really clarify, clarify for me. If you've got a 200 pound woman who's five foot five Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, medium build. So that would be, you're not going to do like how many, 
So that would be still around 100, 120 grams of protein. Yeah, yeah. Well, even like up to 150 grams. But to, to be honest, what I do is I'll meet them where they're at. So yeah. if that woman was having, you know, 80 grams of protein a day, once we've had a track for a week and she's having 70, well, sometimes even 50 grams of protein, right. all I'm going to do is be adding 20 grams onto that or 30 grams onto that a day to start with and just gradually trying to increase that, you know, and just get them to be more aware of of the foods they're eating more than anything really is a starting point, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then the more protein, the healthier fats, the less cravings you have. So that's the attainment phase. Mm. And then as far as a physical activity, weekly workout routine, is it how often, how much? That's a great question. So the strength training or the resistance training will always be like the cornerstone of the program Mm -hmm. because it's very common. As you know yourself, metabolism is very complex next to the human brain is the second most complex thing. So a lot of studies don't even account for this yet, but they're coming through. But basically lifting weights really supercharges your metabolism more so, you know, if you look at studies, it says, you know, like five to eight pounds of muscle, uh, sorry, one pound of muscle will burn like five, uh, sorry, uh, five to 13 calories. But it's the whole process of actually building muscle, such as eating more protein, making healthier choices, having good sleep that actually has a good effect on the metabolism, you know? So that'll be the main port of call. It'll be kind of like, for, it depends on what they were doing before, but even just if it's a beginner, uh, generally, like I said, most people are a decent level when I take them on. If it's someone, for example, a middle-aged woman with menopause, if they haven't been doing any strength training, I'll start them off of like two workouts a week. So two purposeful full body sessions a week. We'll start there for the first month or so. And then we'll eventually kind of crank that up to three sessions per week. Uh, and combine that with, you know, the lifestyle and nutrition stuff then, you know? Yeah, no, that sounds <clears> good. And so then that can, you can, you'll get results with that. And then staying the course, we talked about that mm. when you interviewed me, like yep. tips for staying the course or when you've had a setback, getting back on track, what are some mm. of the mindsets and strategies that you use with your clients in your transformational programs to help them keep that because this can be really hard there's so many setbacks and things that can throw us off absolutely and it goes back to what you touched on earlier is like the vision and the why why it's important to you and really just continuously reinforcing and reminding Mm -hmm. my clients you know because when we have the initial consultation i go deep 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 into the why the real reason to change why is that important to you what will happen if you don't you know if you don't take action you know where will you be a year from now five ten years from now so it really raises that awareness and makes people realize, oh, actually, this is really important. And this is the reason why, you know, so that vision and the why I always kind of go back to that. So, you know, human behavior is complex, right? Not everyone's consistent. Some people say one thing and then they, you know, it's hard to back it up sometimes, right? Uh, busy female with three kids working 50 hours a week, for example, one client I had before, you know, it's hard to kind of stick to things and be consistent so i'll always bring it back to the why uh, but also the other mindset thing is just it's just self-compassion because the, one of the worst things is especially with my most of my clients being high achievers they can beat themselves up a lot and i'm sure you can relate to this right we're high achievers sometimes you can get into your own head and if you have like a bad day or even a bad week you can start beating yourself up and being your own worst enemy and then ultimately sabotage him right so that's a big one. Um, there's, there's another big one as well, which is like perfectionism. Uh, sorry, perfectionism, which is a common oh, thing. Oh, yeah, that's a big yep. one. Oh, it's a big one. It's uh, what I call a, like a self-sabotage superpower, right? That's one of the common ones. It is uh, perfectionism. So I always say just consistency over perfection, right? If you can give me, you don't have to be perfect. I made this clear at the start of the program. If you can give me at least 80% consistency minimum, you're going to get life-changing results. It's just inevitable. But when you try and go 100% and you try and be perfect with everything, and then when you're not perfect or life gets in the way, you hit that big red shiny off button, uh, that is when people end up going backwards. You know what I mean? So they're the main ones that kind of stand out, really. Yeah, no, those are big ones. Definitely see that too. In my own life and with my clients, certainly perfectionism. And I like that you said self-compassion. Like mm. you're, I, w- I always like to think, okay, the you have the train tracks and you think, oh, I've fallen off the track, right? We use that terminology even in what we're saying. I've fallen off the track. I see it in my Facebook groups and my keto green community. I've fallen off the track and I'm, or I'm falling off the wagon. I'm getting back on. And I said, we'll expand those tracks, right? Because it's a matter of like your stay within the tracks. You think of these two lines 
and you're just staying within these lines. Well, widen those lines and, you know, have a second set of lines. So you've got this, you've got this compassion, you've got this boundary for yourself, because as long as you're in the right direction, that's, that's the key. And also the awareness of self-sabotage, like, okay, well, I, you know, I, I did this to myself versus my physiology was out of balance, hormones, there were stressors, cortisols, that robber that came in and derailed me type of thing. And then we need to like redirect and come right back into alignment. Um, when you're working with clients, do you see that? And do you feel like there's like, there's this, um, cushion that we need to 100 percent. that's such a good point yeah you made a great point there and it is ownership right it's sometimes you know we've all been there but people can go into that kind of like almost that victim mentality right it's like you know this is happening it's out of my control ultimately i know it's harder for some people you know some women might be menopause perimenopause with kids to look after and lots of stuff going on in their life so everyone is different but ultimately you know the taking ownership for your actions is key right and bringing it back to as well, one thing I wanted to talk about as well is bringing it back to, right, what has really been holding this person back all these years? Because some people, it's, it's been years or if not decades where they've been struggling with losing weight and gaining it back or yo-yo dieting or, you know, Rob, for example, he'd been fit and healthy for like 15, 20 years, but he was just plateaued. And what's been holding that person back? So that's where a good coach comes in. And when I have that consultation, it's like, I'm looking at, right, is it someone, you, is it your environment, right? Because we know, you know, for example, if you spend, uh, you know, a lot of time with someone who's obese, for example, right? Basically, it gives you, you know, 54% more chance of actually being obese. And even if you're a friend of a friend of someone who's obese, it gives you a 20% more chance of being obese wow. yourself. So, and wow. this is this is a massive study that on millions of people. So it just goes to show, right? And that's not to, you know, shaming anyone, but it just, it just highlights the fact that environment's really important as well. So I just, just want to kind of answer your question there, but just to kind of bring it back in and make sure people don't beat themselves up and fall off that wagon. It's that momentum. That's the most important thing. So I always talk about like just keeping momentum, right? So the person who chips away, for example, and does two workouts a week, right? People, some people think two workouts, is that really going to get me results? Trust me, two to three purposeful workouts a week done consistently forever, right? Is always going to get superior to res results to the average person who goes all five, six times a week and then stops and loses that momentum and falls off the bike, you know? Oh yeah. And I tell you like one of the kickstarts for me, a friend challenged me to do uh, <clears throat> 30 squats each time I eat helps regulate blood sugar, helps build mm. the biggest muscles in our body. But like now it's like, I, I usually do two meals a day. I'm tempted to only do one, but it's only 30 <laughs> squats. It's only 30 exactly. squats. So whether it's a smoothie or whatever it is, if there's anything that I'm putting in my mouth, I am going to, you know, do 30 squats. So um, I think that's, I just started that this week. I'll let you know how it goes, but it's kind of been fun to think, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. It's so fast and it's done with before you know it. And if you add that up over the week, what's that like 400 odd squats? That compound effect all adds up. Absolutely. No, I love that. One of the things you experienced in your life, Martin, was binge eating, binge eating as a bodybuilder. Correct. I need to drink some water. Hold on one second. That's all right. So but do I. Bin, binge eating. And I want to talk about binge eating and binge drinking. Alcohol is a really big problem, especially in menopausal women. We mm. see an increase in alcoholism. And so binge eating, binge drinking. And I want to talk about that and how to recover from that. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, to be honest, I guess I've struggled with both. With the binge drinking, it was uh, more when I was younger and stuff and it just excessively drinking. Uh, but the binge eating was a major problem for me. Um, and, you know, as you know yourself in Australia, for example, you know, over 50% of disorders, eating disorders are categorized under the binge eating disorder. So the funny thing is it went on for about two years and I wasn't even aware. I wasn't accepting the fact that actually I'm binge eating every single weekend. It was more a case for me is where I was kind of distorted. And as a result of doing bodybuilding competitions the wrong way, you know, I just kind of jumped into it without really knowing enough and having the right guidance. Whereas later down the line, when I did my last show, I think it was 2019, you know, I did it all myself and it was like a healthy, it's never healthy doing a bodybuilding comp, but it was the healthiest one I've done and the best I felt. But when I first started doing it, obviously you're restricting all your favorite foods which firstly is unnecessary, uh, but secondly, what it does to your hormones, as you'll know yourself, but what it does to you psychologically more than anything, you know what I mean? And if you look at hormones as well, you know, there's been research to show that like leptin levels are something like 60 to 70% lower 
uh, in in male bodybuilders once they've competed. That's a massive drop. And leptin is obviously the hormone which tells you you're full, right? Mm -hmm. So that's just an that's just an example. But it's the psychological impact. So because I did so many shows, it got to a point after the the second show where I restricted so much. And then I just basically started eating after the show and I just couldn't stop. And that just became a pattern then for like, you know, 18 months to two years, even when I wasn't doing a show, it just the weekend would just be uh, just be bingy and basically. But I always say to my clients, you know, your relationship with food really says more about your relationship with yourself than it does anything else, if that makes sense. And when I look back mentally and emotionally, I wasn't really in the best place. You know, I was kind of uh, not, I wouldn't say depressed at that point, although I did have depression before that. I was just not in a good place mentally. I was quite down. I didn't have much balance in my life. Obviously, competing would have would have reinforced that. And then uh, it was just a major struggle, really. So that went on for almost two years. And how I, how, how I kind of overcame that was just simply by, like I said to you earlier, the approach I take with clients is because of my journey. I've been on myself, you know, and I wasn't conscious necessarily aware what I was doing at the time, but simply just adding in more whole food. So I didn't try and take away the Ben and Jerry's or take away all the Domino's pizzas I was eating. I didn't really think like that. I just thought, right, something's got to change here. So I educated myself and I just started adding in more vegetables, you know, more good quality protein sources. Instead of having like, I used to have like three protein shakes a day just because I was chasing the artificial sweeteners. Mm -hmm. I was chasing the, the, you know, the hedonism that you get or hedonism that you get from food, right? So replacing that for, you know, meat, basically good quality meat sources. And then gradually over time and obviously educating myself, you know, I just started slowly just naturally wanting to eat more whole foods. Um, but that was a journey within itself and it definitely didn't happen overnight, you know? Yeah. And I think it's a substitution versus the deprivation. Yes. Right? It is always finding something to replace or to add versus subtract because then we feel deprived. And for whatever reason, we don't like that. Mm. So we don't like that deprivation. And then that can cause binge eating or binge drinking, for instance. And what about alcohol? What do you recommend? Do you restrict alcohol in your clients? So, for example, just talking about my experience with alcohol. So, in, like in my twenties, I used to go out and binge eat quite a lot. You know what I mean? And party a lot in my twenties. I'm 35 now. Um, and recently, I went to actually went away for two weeks, full transparency. Um, but it was amazing to see how much my alcohol, my relationship with alcohol had changed. Because I would go to clubs and I would see people just, you know, everyone's just literally just going for it, right? There's no limits. People are just going all out. But I um, now I'll have a certain amount of drinks and I just don't want any more alcohol. It's just my body's just like, nah, I don't want any more. I'll just drink water now. You know what I mean? But with my clients, it depends on the client, depends on their relationship with alcohol and how much it's impacting their progress or impacting them. Um, but the approach I will take, for example, with, with, with most habits, but especially with alcohol, it's like, it's always normally a cue, right? So it's like people will finish work. For example, a lot of people, it's a feeling we're chasing, right? So alcohol, some of my clients I have one client, for example, she would finish work and every night it would be like 6.30 p.m. That was her cue to have wine to relax. So she would get home, stressful day at work, right? I've got the kids uh, ready now, 6.30 p.m. I'm going to have a wine. And now it just became a pattern that she cemented in, right? Because she was, so it's like, right, what feeling are you chasing when you have that alcohol? Like, what is it you're looking? What, what you're looking to change your state? I want to get, I want to feel relaxed, right? I want to relax after a long day of work and unwind. It's like, okay, so just going on to what you were saying then, how can we replace that uh, habit with, and get the same feeling or we'll get a similar feeling? So it'll be like, right, okay, what can we do instead? Can we just simply go for a walk? Can we do a bit of yoga, a bit of meditation? Can we do a hobby that you enjoy? You know, whatever that looks like to you. So it's replacing that feeling, but getting that feeling from something which is going to serve you better, basically. So that's kind of the best way really to, to kind of drive habit change. Uh, and that's been really effective when it comes to alcohol. But uh, yeah, it really depends on the person though, you know? Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it can be such a challenge, um, especially when our hormones are off and our protective mm. hormone progesterone Definitely. is going down. And that's a neuroprotective hormone that helps us feel calm, right? Helps produce mm. the neurotransmitter GABA. GABA. And absolutely. so that's our calming hormone. One of the things in, in my practice too, just thinking of, and it's reminding me, I'm like, oh, today I'm going to make myself a better brain and, and sleep. It's a magnesium l 3 nate with a little raspberry flavor powder. So having that in a wine glass or in a cocktail glass or something, or just, you know, drinking that is so satisfying. It's so calming. It's so relaxing. Magnesium l 3 nate crosses the blood brain, blood -brain barrier. Right. So that's yep. helpful. 
And if it's fatigue you're fighting, that's, you know, we can use the Mighty Maca Plus and we can use extra protein. We can use, you know, food as medicine, hydration. Sometimes we're dehydrated and that's why we're exhausted. So looking at the, the root cause, but also creating some habits in place. Okay. Like before I go for, instead of one, you know, uh, two glasses of wine, I'm going to drink this, you know, alkalinizing drink and then see, do I still want the glass of wine or, or stick to one instead of two little replacements, little baby steps when that's, you know, when that's appropriate. hundred percent. Yeah. And even if it's replacing it with something else, like another drink, like simply having like sparkling water on ice with some lemon, drink it, see how you feel, give yourself 15, 20 minutes, you know, maybe try and distract yourself with whatever, but you mentioned, I just want to touch on magnesium L3 and eight as well, because that's been a game changer for, for me. To be honest, I normally get enough magnesium through diet. But I noticed I was deficient at one point, massive difference. And with clients, I've had some really, really good results with the magnesium L3 and a big noticeable difference real quick because, you know, 60 odd percent of people, I think, are deficient in magnesium, if that's correct. So right. looking right. at the deficiencies is is a big thing, which I didn't mention, actually. So so what and speaking of which, what supplements do you like to use with your clients? So the big ones which stand out are the, again, the common kind of deficiency uh, deficiencies that people face and obviously vitamin d even people in you know countries like australia where i live you know uh, they find most people are deficient in vitamin d so vitamin d uh, is is definitely one that we uh, we introduce magnesium is another common one like i say l3 and 8 um i'll look at their diet first and see if I see how much they're getting through diet but bringing that in has been really really effective and then you know to be honest the best um noticeable difference i've had in terms of like vitamins that people are missing out on is is beef organs basically so be a beef organ supplement uh, that's which such is a good thing. Yeah. such a good thing because most people are not that's one thing i really struggle with anna is getting people to eat beef organs it's just not working for me i've tried everything i tell you i've got some books i have one of my plans in menu pause is the carnivore plan you got to try that for yourself but there's some oh, good recipes in there but oh that's still, awesome i'll check it, that out yeah 100%. i was at the grocery store and this is a challenge you know and one of the things places to go is go to an ethnic grocery store so i was at the middle eastern grocery store here in dallas and I was looking, they've got the, the goat's feet, the pig's feet, the tongue, the liver, the, you know, intestines, they've got everything there. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's just like, it's just, you got, it's all good. It's just that mental block to cook it, right? 100%. It's just like anything. If we can eat beef, if we can eat chicken, if we can eat steak, we can eat organs. There's, yeah, it's 100%. Just, it's, it's just a mental block. And the 100%. organs are so rich in those B so vitamins, rich. those bioavailable micronutrients. Choline and as well with beef liver, especially. And I know you can get that from egg yolks, but you get a much higher dose in beef liver. You know, beef liver alone, right? It's the most nutrient dense food you can eat. And me personally, right, Anna, I'll eat, not to go off too much, but I'll eat brains, I'll eat everything. The only one I, I can't eat is kidney. Everything else I actually love. I'm really strange like that. So <laughs> not funny. And then brains. I was talking with my cousin who's from Lebanon and and she was saying that, oh my gosh, she loved brains in a pita bread with some certain seasoning. And it was like her, one of her favorite, her favorite foods. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's, <laughs> it's a mental block. It's certainly 100%. a mental block. One more supplement I wanted to touch on as well, which is sometimes overlooked is creatine. Yeah. So with, with creatine, yeah, you'll know this, but not just because people always think, right, okay, I'm going to build muscle and get better performance. Yes, it's probably the only supplement which crosses over into both. It's actually paramount for obviously health, brain function, immune system, keep going down the list. And most people are kind of deficient in that is what I find as well, because not many people are going to eat enough meat generally from what I've seen uh, to actually get or, you know, red meat or organ meat to actually get that in. You know what I mean? So that's so another one. How much one. do you supplement and how much would you like recommend a, like that 50 year old benchmark woman to supplement if she's, you know, uh, lean body mass or trying to lose that weight? Yeah. Sweet spot for, for creatine, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the sweet spot I seem to find is like anywhere between like three to five grams of creatine five days a week seems to be suffice. People get a noticeable difference. And the funny thing is like, okay, it is about health but you actually look better as well. That's the interesting thing. When you actually lift weights and take creatine, it fills out your muscle bellies. So it actually makes you look tighter and more toned. So like my, my female clients, especially like, oh, wow, I've noticed a difference in, I'm going to keep taking this, you know? Really? So, with creatine? Yeah. I know it's not one that I've supplemented with. So um, not in a long time anyway. And so is there specific forms that are better that you should look for? Do you have recommendations? 
Yeah, generally it's creatine monohydrates. Um, but as you know yourself, there's so many bogus supplements out there now. Like to find a really good one in Australia, I've managed to weed one out a really good one. Um, but yeah, look into that. I can't think of any uh, any brands at the moment, but yeah, definitely look into a good quality creatine monohydrate. And even someone like yourself, you know, you'll get you'll notice, it, especially with performance, with the level you're at, you'll notice a big difference, a big difference, hundred percent in strength recovery and even muscle tone a little bit probably. Uh, that sounds good. So, and you should do it three to five grams at one time a day. And yeah, I would say yourself up to that. That's right. I would I would say start with like three grams five times a day. And that's going to be, to be honest, to, to, to three over. grams five times a day. Okay. Oh, sorry, five times a week. Sorry, not five, five times, times a week. Day. I was like, but, okay, okay, good. Yeah, no, 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 I don't want to be Clarify. doing that. Exactly. Yeah, just like five days a week, and obviously, okay. if you lift the weights, ideally after training, if you're going to lift weights, just to replenish. But have you really seen your acid levels increase with that supplementation, or do you have to watch that? Because I haven't. To be honest, I generally I don't. I'm not really good when it comes to testing and actually doing those uh, tests myself. I just really stay in tune with my body. But generally, I haven't really noticed anything. But I should probably go and get some thorough tests just to make sure. You know. Yeah. Yeah. To see. Cause again, I always say there's seasons for a reason. So, mm. um, you know, taking breaks periodically, it's a good idea, but also understanding what it is doing at the cellular level. So 100%. just looking to see if it increases uric acid or, or it can, you know, potentially, um, really high doses long-term, but I don't know what that threshold is. And again, it's yeah. going to be individual. hundred percent. Function. Definitely. But I, obviously I've looked into all the research and stuff and it doesn't seem to be any negative, uh, you know, obviously you can with kidneys, some people can't take it, right. Cause okay. they just can't tolerate it. And it's just so much uh, pressure on, on the kidneys. Um, but yeah, generally, you know, totally fine. Sounds good. That... But yeah, everything, everything has a trade-off though. You're right. Everything has a trade-off. So it's something you've got to pay attention to. Definitely. Well, you've given us so many pearls, Martin, tell our audience where they can follow up with you and your podcast. I love your podcast as well. So awesome. share with us Thank how you. my audience can find you. So yeah, the best place to find me, I guess, is Instagram. So at Martin Silva Fitness, Silva, obviously spelled Portuguese way, as we said, S-I-L-V-A. And my podcast is uh, Optimize Your Body. So it's called Optimize Your Body, but Optimize is not spelled the American way. It's spelled S-E on the end of Optimize, not Z-E just for the uh, the audience. And yeah, that's, probably, that's the best two places really to find me. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. YouTube as well. I've got some good stuff on there. Martin Silver Fitness. But yeah, they're the best uh, handles for me, really. Well, awesome. All right, you guys, check out Martin Silva Fitness at Instagram and check out his podcast, Optimize. Uh, optimize Your Body. Your body, optimize your body. And um, and you guys, any questions that you have, don't hesitate to send those in. You guys at my Dr. Anna Kabeca um, website, go to the show page. You'll be able to see this, get the links to the video, you, wherever you're watching this on YouTube, listening on iTunes or Podcast Addict or Spotify. Be sure to leave a review. Your input, your feedback is so important. It helps us raise in the rankings too. And I'm so grateful for those. So I read every single one of them and I'm thankful. I want to thank again, my guest, Martin Silva, but before you go, I forgot, I almost forgot you guys. I always do my girlfriend doctor show pillars and ask you a few rapid fire questions. So real quick, um, what is your favorite food? Favorite food definitely hands down is always going to be a good old grass fed steak. Mm -hmm. Simple. Yeah. My favorite food. It works every single time. <laughs> Perfect. So that's in our nourish pillar. Second pillar is shine. What's the um, one thing, either it's a habit or a supplement or a food that helps you radiate health, look healthier, look better? Yeah. A supplement. I would say, could I, can I say, uh, can I say saunas? Am I allowed to bring yeah, that in? Absolutely. Saunas hit me differently. They do something spectacular to me, to my mental health and to how I feel my energy. So if I have a sauna, oh, it's perfect. So back home real quick in Bondi, there's one right on the beach in Bondi beach, jump in there, jump in the ocean. Oh my God. That is my ultimate fix. Oh my gosh, that sounds great. I have an infrared sauna here, but in a hundred degrees heat here in Texas, I haven't been in it lately. <laughs> you don't need I gotta, that. I got to I got to do that again. The next pillar is awaken, Martin. Martin, what is something that feeds your mind? Is there a current book that you're reading or um, a mantra or practice to awaken? 
Mm, yeah, I love reading in general, right? So books stimulate me and that's non-negotiable for me every single day. I'm trying to think if there's a specific book right now, but there's nothing really in particular. <clears throat> what I would say, I'm just trying to think of any particular podcast now as well. But um, no, generally, if I could think of a book that was uh, a real game changer for me, to be honest, I can't think of any off the top of the head, but just generally books for me are like just my kind of escape, you know, like mm -hmm. every day before I go to bed. I need my 20, 30 minutes of breathing, uh, of, of reading after I've done my deep breathing. And that just helps me decompress and just kind of escape in a way, you know what I mean? And just relax. Yes, absolutely. I like that breathing, reading. Yes. Um, and um, embrace is the last one. Okay. What's your favorite sexual position? Oh, okay. You hit me. You caught me off guard with that one. I like that though. Uh, my favorite sexual position has got to be doggy style, but with the woman lying on her front on the bed, basically generally just lying flat on the front. Okay. Bum in the air. Generally it's quite simple, but that's my favorite position. Ah, uh, love it. Love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for <laughs> having me on Anna. It is great having you on and we'll be in touch back and forth. And thank you so much. Uh, it's great to have, uh, great to have you in our community. Thanks, Martin. A pleasure. Thank you for having me on. You are welcome. And to everyone in our girlfriend doctor community, I am grateful for you. Please share and definitely rate this, uh, rate the girlfriend doctor show. It means so much in our rankings. Thank you again, everyone. Till next time.